let's talk about inter the interference effect and concurrent training a little bit. Let's do it. Um, the road to Athens segment of the last podcast was a hit. There were multiple people, and and by that I mean two or potentially three people uh, who asked for more concurrent training content on the podcast. Uh, so is that a representative sample of our listeners? Probably yes. not. But let's uh, let let's meet their needs right now. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, so the title of the article I wrote was, does the interference effect get larger as training status increases? Title of the study I reviewed was development of maximal dynamic strength during concurrent resistance and endurance training in untrained, moderately trained and trained individuals, a systematic review and meta-analysis by Petrie and colleagues. Um, so in, in this, uh, meta-analysis, I mean, you, you can probably tell what they did just from the title. Uh, they started with a systematic literature search. They uh, identified studies with um, healthy subjects between 18 and 40 years old. Um, the group, the studies needed to compare a group performing uh, both lower body resistance training and endurance training versus a group doing an identical resistance training program, but no endurance training. Uh, the subjects all needed to have the same training status. Uh Resistance training needed to occur at least twice per week at uh, a ten at an intensity of at least sixty percent of one RM. Uh, the endurance training needed to uh, at least be of moderate intensity, um, so not like walking programs or anything like that. Uh, and the studies needed to report changes in maximal squat or leg press strength. Those were the inclusion criteria. They found twenty seven studies. Um, all of which were judged to be of either moderate to high quality. Uh, seven, seven studies were on untrained subjects, 10 were on moderately trained subjects, and uh, 10 were on trained subjects. I'll note that I don't necessarily agree with the, uh, the researcher's characterization of untrained versus moderately trained in this study. So they categorized a study as being on moderately trained subjects if the subjects... Um, were reported as being active. <laughs> so you'd only be counted as untrained if they reported that like people were completely sedentary. If someone was described as recreationally active, but not participating in resistance training, they'd still count them as moderately trained for this meta-analysis. I don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, yeah. Cause I mean, a lot of times for studies that are sampling like uh, college students, mm -hmm. for example, which is a huge percentage of studies it's like ah you're a college student you go to class every day you know maybe you play kickball twice a week moderately right. trained yeah you're, yeah you're, yeah yeah so uh i functionally just view it as trained versus untrained i i don't like the the untrained versus moderately trained distinction that they made in this study uh but anyway th that's what they did that's the nomenclature i'll use moving forward uh so just be aware that when i say moderately trained i'm talking untrained, but, but fairly active. Um, so anyway, they, they ran the meta three different ways. Um, first, they just looked at all effect sizes from all studies. Uh, second, they looked at uh, just studies where the endurance and resistance training were performed in the same session. So, you know, you show up at the gym, you run for 30 minutes, and then you lift, or you show up at the gym, you lift, and then you run for 30 minutes, uh, all in one session. And then the third way they ran it was just looking at studies where the endurance and resistance training took place in different sessions. So they could have been on different days. They could have been uh, on the same day, but like you lift in the morning, run in the evening or vice versa. Um, so they, they looked at it in, th in those uh, three different ways. So in, in their first meta-analysis, when it was just all effect sizes from all studies, they found that for untrained subjects, uh, Concurrent training led to strength gains that were just as large as only doing resistance training. Um, for moderately trained subjects, there also wasn't a statistically significant effect, but there was an effect size of 0.2, p-value of 0.08, uh, favoring resistance training only for strength gains. And then for trained subjects, there was a, there was a significant effect. Small effect size, uh, Cohen's D of 0.35, and that was statistically significant. So basically, you see this pattern where 
the magnitude of the interference effect or stated another way, the superiority of just doing resistance training versus concurrent training uh, got um, larger and larger as training status increased such that there was virtually no effect for sedentary individuals and a small but statistically significant effect for trained individuals. So moving on, in the studies where endurance and resistance training were performed in the same training session, a similar pattern emerged, but the effect sizes were larger, particularly for the trained subjects. So for untrained individuals, again, virtually no effect. Um, for moderately trained subjects, you see a, a small to trivial effect, again, Cohen's D of 0.23. And again, not quite statistically significant, p-value of 0.14. But then for the trained subjects, you, you're, you're seeing now a pretty notable effect size of 0.66. Um, that's generally termed a, a moderate effect, not quite bordering on a large effect, which is typically typically going to be 0.8 uh, with, with the standard cutoffs. But that's, that's a relatively hefty moderate effect. Um, so especially for trained subjects, when you're doing concurrent training with both, uh, endurance training and lifting in the same session, there seems to be a pretty negative effect on strength outcomes. Uh, it, it, that's not to say you'll get weaker. You will continue getting stronger, but probably at a notably slower rate than you would have if you were just lifting and not doing endurance training. Uh, and then finally, um, when they, uh, just looked at studies where endurance and resistance training were performed in separate sessions, either separate times on the same day or on different days. They actually found no significant effect regardless of training status. So it seemed that just separating out the stimuli um, basically completely did away with the interference effect such that concurrent training was just as effective for strength development as only doing strength training was. Uh, so I'll note, I do think that um, in a meta-analysis like this, where, where basically you're just looking at two training variables, like did you just lift weights or did you lift weights and also do cardio, you're missing out on some degree of nuance. Like you're you're not you're basically not able to look to see if the dose makes the poison, uh, as it were. So, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would not be an absolutist on this topic and say like, look, man, like if you're trying to win USAP, USAPL nationals and also complete an ultra marathon and train for both at the same time, you're definitely not going to have a negative effect on your strength gains. I, I don't think that that's a justifiable take. Uh, most of these studies use pretty moderate levels of endurance training in them. So I, I think the average uh, frequency and duration was like 30 minutes of about 30 minutes of cardio about three times per week. So like that level of endurance training when combined with resistance training, if you're doing the endurance training and resistance training in separate sessions, doesn't seem to have a negative effect on strength development. Uh, but if you did considerably more endurance training, it probably would. Um, but at least this meta-analysis doesn't really give us any clues for where that threshold lies. Um, and the other thing I'll note just uh, related to this meta-analysis is when people talk about concurrent training, the first study they generally bring up, and for good reason, uh, is a study by Hickson from 1980. Uh, this, this is kind of the granddaddy of them all in the concurrent training literature. Title is Interference of Strength Development by simultaneous by Simultaneously Training for Strength and Endurance. So the, the title of this study is where the term interference effect comes from. Uh, the study was from 1980. It was the first study um, rigorously looking at the interference effect and whether concurrent training uh, had negative effects on strength development. And so, yeah, this is the first study that people tend to cite. Um, and it has a pretty large effect. So um, in, in this meta-analysis, the Hickson study, the, the effect in favor of resistance training only over endurance training was about 0.61. Uh, and the subjects in that study were moderately trained, which, again, I would probably refer to as untrained. So when you look at the total batch of effect sizes 
from studies on moderately trained or untrained subjects in this meta-analysis, the pooled effect size for all of those is about 0.1. Uh, and the Hickson study, I believe, had the either the largest or second largest effect size of any study that had been done. Uh, and the effect size for that was about six times larger than the pooled effect size uh, of the other studies on untrained and moderately trained subjects. So it's it's very not representative of the body of literature, um, which isn't a knock on it. But th this relates to something we've talked about on the podcast before, and that is when a body of literature is just developing, you shouldn't necessarily assume that the average effect seen in the first couple of studies in the area are is going to be representative of where kind of the pooled effect estimate will wind up once more research is done. Uh, and it can go in both directions. So the typical way it goes is that early effect estimates are quite a bit larger than the eventual kind of pooled effect estimate that a body of literature settles on. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, well, there, there are several reasons for that. But one of the biggest ones is that most early research in a particular area is just kind of like proof of concept research, where if you are... Hickson, you're an enterprising researcher in 1980, and you think that doing concurrent training will lead to smaller strength gains than just doing resistance training. If that is your assumption, what you need to do is you need to publish research showing that this is an area of research that warrants further study. And so you're essentially trying, you're trying to design a study that will find a positive effect to validate the need for further research. And so I, I don't have the, the details in front of me right now, but if memory serves, the endurance training protocol in the Hickson study was one of the more challenging endurance training protocols that has been done in any concurrent training study up to this point. Um, so it, it was basically designed to find an effect. And then once that effect was found, future studies have kind of used more uh, kind of more chill, more representative, I suppose, endurance training protocols and have found considerably smaller effects. Um, sometimes it can work in the opposite direction as well. So for example, if say a supplement comes on the market and they find that uh, maybe this has a small positive effect, it could, it could turn out to be that like a different form of the supplement could be more effective. Uh, it could be that the dose used in the first studies was too small. And so you could see an increase in the pooled effect estimate over time. But uh, the, the key point is just that like, if there's only one or two studies in a body of literature, um, it very well could be the case that the effect they're seeing is a real effect. But the magnitude of the effect being reported may not necessarily be representative of where that body of literature will end up.